waiting for Anton. Maybe we can get started by kicking off and get everyone has a chance to give an intro, maybe talk a little bit about your project as well as what platform you chose to build on. Cool, yeah, I can start. Um, so I'm Tanner, I'm from Kick. Uh, we're the team that initially launched the cryptocurrency Kin. Kin is now used by about 57 different apps. So we're just one participant in this broader ecosystem at this point. Uh, when we first launched Kin, we started on Ethereum. Uh, that had its challenges. So we started working with Stellar, ended up forking Stellar, we've been running our own fork of Stellar uh, with other people in the ecosystem for the past year and a half or so. Uh, and then just recently we put forth a proposal to the broader Kin ecosystem, but a potential migration to Solana. So we're in that proposal stage right now. Uh, been lots of interesting learnings building on Ethereum, then moving to Stellar, a fork of Stellar, uh, and then looking at different public chains, uh, and then ultimately putting forth this proposal. So uh, lots of good learnings along the way, and I'm sure might have some insights that might be helpful to some people uh, in this panel. Yeah, definitely want to dig in on you guys forking Stellar, I think, was a really interesting choice um, mm. and maybe some of the learnings there. Uh, Dylan, do you want to go next? Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Dylan. I'm one of the co-founders of Commonwealth Labs. Um, we're a decentralized governance startup. Um, so we have two products, Commonwealth, the internet chain, um, essentially governance interface. Um, and then we also have Edgeware, which is a uh, Polkadot smart contract platform. Uh, so for us, uh, we started, you know, back in 2018, um, we, with a large focus on formalizing governance. Um, so really figuring out the ins and outs of, um, how on-chain governance was actually going to be pushed forward into the future. Um, so we originally had started experimenting with a few things on Ethereum, um, with the Ethereum identity specs, essentially. Um, we found out basically like any transaction, like the gas fees at that time, even like were, were super high. Um, so it just felt a little bit untenable to actually like push through a transaction or, or potentially scale something. Um, so it felt really important to build things from the ground up. Um, Polkadot and Substrate was announced um, around that time. And so we're really excited to, to be able to basically build things from the ground up. Um, we kind of evaluated Cosmos as well um, as another chain um, SDK. Um, but the governance modules that were kind of built in um, weren't as robust at that point in time. Um, and so felt it was, you know, kind of uh, easier to, to build within the ecosystem. Um, yeah, that's a quick TLDR. TR. Um, we launched the chain in February. Um, we're going through the first upgrade right now. We've had a number of proposals kind of go in. Um, and already people are talking about uh, kind of iterating and uh, building from there. Hey, Curtis. Hey, everyone. Uh, Tanner, Dylan, nice to meet you guys. And uh, hi to the audience. Um, thanks for coming and seeing us today. My name is Dave Hendricks. I am the CEO and co-founder of a digital transfer agent called Vertalo. Uh, basically, what we do is we take your shareholder registry, like your cap table, and we put it on chain. Um, and so, you know, if you're a, a company that's building on blockchain and you've got equity, you can call us up and you can put your equity and your warrants and your options and all that stuff on Vertalo and run it that way. So how do we get here? And what's that have to do with chains and uh, protocols and et cetera? So we started the company in 2016. Uh, I was living in London. Uh, my CTO was in Austin. Uh, in Austin in 2017, we started the company. We built a, an initial product for my previous company. It was a due diligence product. We built it using smart contracts. It was a way to connect uh, organizations with the people that worked at those organizations for for documents and stuff like that. It was, it was kind of solving a, a HR capital data problem. We initially built it with Ethereum. And, um, and then in 2000, uh, September 2017, we said, well, look, everyone's raising money. Uh, we should you know, do an ICO and raise some non-dilutive funding using an ICO. And my, one of my co-founders who's an attorney said, no, we can't do that. So we started an STO. Okay, and so in October 2017, we started an SDO. We built all of our smart contracts with Ethereum. And, you know, at that time, it was really funny because there was so much activity that it was getting really expensive to trade these things. It was really expensive to build them. People were really busy. We, we had to learn everything ourselves. We continued to work with Ethereum for a while, and then we met the Tezos community in the summer of 2019. And we found that the uh, we found a lot of synergies between the way that um, 
the Tezos community saw the, the development of smart contracts and, and how they dealt with wallets and a whole bunch of other architectural considerations that we found that after working with Ethereum for a couple of years were really a closer fit for the way we wanted to build things out. So uh, about a year ago, we started working really, really closely with the Tezos community, and that's been a lot of fun. We can talk more about that later, but um, you know, we, we've worked with both, and well, we work with some folks who also do some stuff with Stellar and, and, and also some private chains. Thanks for the overview, you guys. Um, so one thing you, you kind of all mentioned is different features that drew you to the platforms that you ended up choosing. When you evaluate a platform, what, what are the top set of features that are go into your decision making and I'm picking those? So maybe it's Dylan, why don't, why don't you start? You talked about too. governance modules, yeah. but yeah. yeah, anything else that were top of mind? Um, uh, kind of like the community as well. Um, I think just like building within the ecosystem that's excited to work alongside and just experiment with the projects. I think um, for us, um, since it's more developer driven, um, being able to participate in that ecosystem, a lot of Rust devs, um, uh, a lot of different runtime modules that can be directly integrated. Um, there's a lot of, you know, um, I guess even in the past month, a lot of great work going in, um, on, you know, with with Rub3, the foundation, as well as like other um, teams, um, Ethereum compatibility layers. Um, and so we're really excited to uh, integrate that. Into um, but yeah, the kind of give and take, especially for the developers um, and then just like the, the broader community, I think it's it's always nice to be building into a, a tailwind. Um, that That's kind of the, honestly, the, the main other main concern. Um, and then with the, the full kind of like customization, I know we, we have a different, I guess, like set of features that we're, we're looking for compared to, uh, to Dave and uh, Tanner from this perspective. Tanner, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with all of those. I think for us, um, when we look at things, there's like three main buckets that we would evaluate in terms of um, protocols. And one would be developer experience, two would be end consumer experience. And consumer experience could also broadly be bucketed as like performance. But I think there's a lot of nuance within that. It's not enough to just say like things happen really fast, but there's things like what's the fee structure? How dynamic is that? Uh, what is an end consumer experience going to look like? Um, and then I would say just alignment with the ecosystem, which kind of goes along with uh, what Dylan was saying. Like a good example would be like, you know, we were working with Stellar, ended up forking Stellar. Uh, and through that process, um, we there was a lot of like upstream and downstream um, contributions. So there are certain upgrades that Stellar would make to core Stellar that we would implement into our fork. And then vice versa, there were times where we were um, making some type of changes and that uh, was happening then uh, back downstream to the Stellar core. But there was no explicit incentive alignment between those things. Uh, like there's no explicit value capture that um, the Stellar core was getting versus our fork. So when we were looking at um, what things look like uh, going forward, it's important for us to have aligned incentives for the long term as well. So yeah, while well, I would say like developer experience, how easy it is for developers to build, performance, what are consumers seeing when they're actually using the applications built on top of this protocol, and then how do we have alignment with the different ecosystems? So when you guys actually forked it, um, how much of your time was spent, you know, backporting fixes from the Stellar Foundation versus like bu building your own product? Yeah, it's a good question. It uh, it was a long process, so it's not like it was, and maybe I can just give a bit of history. Like we launched September 2017, uh, but three months later is when we started working with the Stellar team to see if it made sense to build on the Stellar protocol, and that was our initial intent. Uh, and then we had built a test net to start testing out a few different things. One thing that was a challenge for us and our consumers is uh, different apps within the ecosystem are transacting in very small amounts. So the fee structure didn't make a lot of sense. We wanted to do anti-spam in a different way. So rather than have uh, fees for spam, have a whitelisting process where basically like 95% of the bandwidth is allocated to whitelisted apps, 5% is uh, permissionless, and then assuming that it doesn't fill up and no one's malicious, then you can transact for free. That's not infinitely scalable, uh, but that was an implementation we wanted to do. That didn't make sense for Stellar Core. So, that's why in this test net, we ended up just forking it. And basically what it was is it was uh, Kick and then 10 other developers that were building in the ecosystem all set up independent nodes. So then that was the, the quorum that was happening there. So 
Uh, it was mostly built out of needs and necessity basis. It was very collaborative with the seller team. I think they're really smart and have attacked things in um, some interesting ways. Um, and ultimately, we just made a decision uh, to fork it. it. It was something that I think everyone just agreed that the direction we were going made sense to uh, to fork. Dave, uh, so you mentioned with Tezos, their smart contract approach plus their wallet infrastructure were the primary drivers. Any any other features that spoke to you? Well, actually, the primary driver for us is uh, community and momentum. Um, so those are technical reasons to choose. But really, when you're trying to build something which you think is going to have some legs, you don't want to do it alone. Um, you You want to have... A strong community that you can call on you know like we have a slack channel for this where we can get help from people who are working on different parts of for example the core uh, tezos architecture so we can we can call on those people really really quickly and get answers and you know we're all kind of working in you know towards the same direction we saw that over the last year or so that the tezos development community has grown dramatically um and uh we're you know, this community is also highly decentralized. Um, it's not run by a studio, which is run by a whale. And um, that's a that's a really big issue. Um, there's, uh, when we, we uh, you know, when you're building something like us, like an enterprise platform, we're not building a DAO, we're building a real enterprise B2B company. We wanna work, uh, we wanna understand that we can work safely with the community and and not get ripped off okay by by people that have that don't care about economic and proper economic incentives and so we wanted to stay away from whale driven um studio models and you know central centralized models there's one thing really great about the tezos ecosystem the tezos foundation had some interesting challenges in the beginning of its lifestyle life in its in its in its life but now it's making a lot of grants and those grants are just going out to folks who are building things and it's not there's not like a, a central ulterior motive to it and it's, it's supporting projects all around the world and so for us uh, as a company that's building technology for digital assets that is jurisdictionally and asset agnostic we want to be able to work with teams that are all over the world um, and so that was a really cool one the other thing was that Tezos specifically, it already went through this proof of stake transition. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think about building on Ethereum right now, Ethereum is about to go through what we think is a pretty major fork and it's going to be a schism and it's going to affect a lot of people. And, you know, are, you know, what's that going to look like? You know, are gas costs going to go, go up? Are there going to be fewer people validating uh, transactions using the old method, or are we going to have to rewrite everything? The other thing is, we can't stand MetaMask, okay? Um, <laughs> anything that's built around MetaMask, okay, it's just, that's just, it, that's a recipe for low adoption. And, and so we wanted to get away from anything that was architected that required people to use awful products. I'm sorry, MetaMask team, total props for getting a whole bunch of people to use something like that. We just don't think that that is uh, a normal user experience. And if you want to keep this thing small and, and, and everything like continue to make things hard to use. And so we found that we could make better UI, better UX products without having to deal with some of the other protocols kind of uh, baggage. And so, you know, that's, those are, so my editorial reasons for choosing other protocols. So, got it. That, that's helpful. Um, so, what, one thing that I think might be helpful to anyone in the audience that's actually like starting a project now is, at some point, as a developer, you have to like make your bed and pick a platform. How often are you guys like once you've made your bed? like reevaluating the other products out there and being like, hmm, maybe we should make a switch or we should stick with the decision we made. Um, anyone, uh, Dylan, did you want to start? Sure, uh, I'll go for it. Um, you know, it's something that we definitely grumble about. I think for us, um, it's the experiences um, 
uh, you know, just, just think about the developer experience. I think that's been the, would be the main driver of kind of like if we were to system. Um, Substrate itself has like stabilized um, a great amount over the past uh, year or two. Um, Polkadot's like launching and so it, more eyes on it, it, it should kind of only improve. But certainly there was a period of time in which thinking about like, okay, did we make the right choice back in 2018, 2019? Um, I think the, other thing, I guess, for us that that is potentially more interesting is there's a lot of cross-chain um, integrations that are being built. Um, so, of course, one uh, building out uh, Cosmos, um, uh, sorry, Cosmos pair, uh, parachain bridge essentially to Polkadot hmm. um, or to EOS or something like that. And I think the the thing for us actually in the future is like, okay, um, right now Edgeware itself has like its its own set of community members, um, and so um, if we're going to participate in kind of an interoperability layer um, or, you know, bridge to other ecosystems, um, should we just integrate like the Cosmos SDK and then use that for shared security or message passing versus Polkadot? Um, that's something I think that will continue to play out, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see. I think it's um, what other ecosystems kind of are, are out there and uh, how can we actually participate in them from a shared security and governance perspective? Got it. And you guys with with your stake drop, you sort of bootstrapped existing users on Ethereum. And I think that's like a broader trend is for anyone building on a newer platform is how do you kind of co-op some of those existing network effects and pull it over onto the new network? Yeah. Um, it's Tanner yeah, and Dave, really cool. did you guys? Yeah, I think uh, like D Dylan raised a good point there um, on some of the cross chain stuff. Like the switching cost is reducing between moving different chains. Like when we went from Ethereum to Stellar, that was a fairly onerous process. Um, there's things like we had to work with, uh, and all the developers had to work with different exchanges to actually have people like move through an exchange. Someone does money transmission to burn one token, then mint a new token. But there's cross chain uh, interoperability we're starting to see now. Uh, even as we're contemplating a potential move from Stellar to Solana, they run on the same elliptic curve. So there's uh, a way to like recreate public private key pairs and make that more seamless for people uh, still in a decentralized way where no one ever touches the private key outside of the user. But the switching cost is reducing. Uh, to come back to your earlier question, like for us, like we're consumer product people first, uh, and that's how we've always thought about it. Same with all the other developers in the, eco the Ken ecosystem. They're building consumer products. So it's a, a needs-based requirement for um, looking at different protocols. Like we're trying to find the technology that supports good consumer experience versus just try to build a science experiment and then see if we can get people to use it after that. Um, so in terms of your question is like, how often are we reevaluating? Like we're always looking at all the different options. From day one, we launched on Ethereum, we're looking at layer two, we're looking at other chains, layer one. Uh, we ended up forking our own that was not necessarily uh, something that we saw was like the long-term and more things come to market. We're always looking at how those can be incorporated. Uh, and then the nice thing is you can have high performance base chains and then different things on top of that, uh, that you can start to plug in with things like Cosmos Hub. Um, DeFi is like another, I would say, powerful network effect on Ethereum. Uh, but we're gonna start to see, I think that bridge into other ecosystems through Tendermint. Um, so there's just more optionality and I think that's good for the space as well. Like anytime there's lower switching costs, it creates higher competition and more performance. Yeah, so so we started on, on Ethereum and we still support Ethereum and we can swap from Ethereum to Tezos in our system in, I don't know, about 90 seconds. Um, we can swap from Tezos to Ethereum in about 90 seconds. And we expect that there are going to be other chains that we'll support because when you build an enterprise product like like what we're building, and everyone who's technical on this call understands this, you're actually not building on the protocol. The protocol is just a database layer um, for certain things. You know, you're not building the interface in the protocol. Um, there's all this other stuff that you have that has nothing to do with the protocol. Um, and it's really the, the element that you're owning or the contract that you're creating or a connection between systems, which is protocol oriented. So this is early days, um, so early. Um, it's kind of like, it's not even 1994, it's like 1989, okay, in <laughs> internet days. Um, and, and a lot of people are still having, are forced to use dial-up modems 
and command lines to do things. And that's why we have such a low adoption. So, you know, choosing, you know, it's super important to future proof. We future proofed our platform. We expect to work with a lot of different protocols, but we like Tezos and we think that Tezos is a really interesting protocol for uh, governance. They've got a self amending ledger. Uh, they've already got proof of stake built in. Uh, we understand how the wallets work, um, and a lot of people are working towards it. So, um, I don't know. You, you, like, if you if you if you hardwire uh, and hard code stuff into your system right now, you're probably not too smart. <laughs> you <probably> should <laughs> leave some optionality. So, yeah, I mean, sort of riffing on that a, a bit. I, I feel like people initially started with building on the decentralized platform and then starting to peel some back to centralized, right? Because like, if you go full decentralized early, it's, it's, it's hard to get those top of funnel users. Like they have to like onboard to MetaMask and there's, there's, there, there's a lot of hurdles there. What, when you look at your systems, what are parts that you think you could, de you could decentralize? versus what are things that are worth centralizing to create a better user experience? Uh, mid Tanner, why don't you start? Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, to us, like the, the most interesting and most important thing around um, like the decentralization is decentralizing uh, value or money to be more explicit. Uh, we think it's important that people have control over that, both for, it's not just a philosophical standpoint, like being able to decentralize money then obfuscates the need to work through traditional banking rails, which is very cumbersome. Like something that we saw early on with Kick uh, was we wanted to build even just like a simple payments platform. And then to look at that, if we wanted to unlock payments in the app just for simple peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, uh, we we're gonna have to go state by state, country by country to get all these different money licenses. Uh, but then if you can have someone be their own bank, you can obfuscate the banking system, uh, not in a malicious way, but just in a way that's efficient, then yeah. that unlocks a whole breadth of consumer experience. But on the other side, uh, it's not like we're trying to put every um, message that was ever sent like on the blockchain. That would just be inefficient. It would slow everything down. So there's certain things that are in terms of like transferring value. Um, that's important and people can be their own bank and that's where uh, it unlocks uh, the ability to roll out a global payment system. But it doesn't mean that every piece of infrastructure um, needs to be on the blockchain. So we start at like, what's the minimum set of things that need to be decentralized? And then even that, I would say decentralization is a bit of a loaded term. It, it's not a binary thing where it's like you're either decentralized or centralized. There's obviously a spectrum. So it's like, how decentralized does it need to be? Is it that you want to make sure that um, no one single actor can um, influence some type of behavior? Okay, what's your threshold for that? And then having different thresholds for different types of activity. If you're moving very small amounts of money, maybe you have a smaller threshold and then bigger amounts are, are others. And then same thing with like identity and others. So I think there's a lot of nuance there. We could probably spend hours talking about it, um, but that would be like the general, <laughs> general sense. Yeah, you know, um, we we look to the chain for the data that we present in our visual layer. So we're not uh, we're not storing share ownership or asset ownership centrally, um, except for a backup record that we keep because we're SEC regulated. I know that's going to want you guys to bring torches and pitchforks to my house. <laughs> but we're we're you know we 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 maintain very very important ledgers at least we think it's important of ownership of of real world assets and in order to make those assets to run those assets on chain and also make them tradable the the people mommy and daddy have told us that we need to keep an off chain ledger uh, or just, we should say not on a public blockchain ledger of logs of what's happened so in case something goes wrong there's another ledger so while our while the main source of truth for us is so-called decentralized we also keep uh we also keep kind of a record uh hmm. because this isn't secret stuff like people want to actually fix things when they go wrong it actually is meaningful for people to fix things but the other thing is like 
we have to also kind of um, disabuse ourselves of this notion of decentralization uh, to uh, like all the way out because most of us are running some stuff on Amazon or EC2 or Azure or something like that. We don't even know where it is. I mean, we don't know whether it's in one crate somewhere. Like they just put us all in one crate in case they want to burn us down sometime. Or, or, <laughs> it's, or, it's a risk. You know, Platform like it shut us off. They're like, hey, cut off the big yeah. tube to the Amazon, you know, crate. And then like the, and then the blockchain is dead or whether we're actually on a whole bunch of NA1, NA7, NA9 and EU5 or wherever. I don't know. So I don't know how decentralized or centralized we are, but we try to be decentralized about the right things, which just means anti-fragility. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what we're just trying to be is anti-fragile at the end of the day. And, um, and the database using blockchain as a database is an anti-fragility measure. Um, and it, you know, you know, carbon copy truth. So. Great. Yeah. Dylan, um, I, we have two minutes left, so I give you, give you the floor on centralization versus decentralization. All right. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm for decentralization, uh, mic drop. No, um, you know, I kind of want to <laughs> just echo what, uh, what, uh, Tanner and Dave said, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a complex topic. I think we're all kind of like, we want to make the thing work, um, in general, and that's kind of, uh, the name of the game and then adding in, not adding in, but, uh, making sure we take in decentralization, um, along the specific axes, um, is super important. Um, what, what Dave mentioned about, uh, having um a, like a you know a query layer that you can actually use on the back end um to just like fill up the ui uh, is super important um just from a load time side like i think yeah. you know if we're pulling all the validators um you know uh it, with 400 validators like a page it takes like you know 30 seconds and it's kind of subpar from the user experience side um so having a little bit of redundancy there um in like a traditional web 2 setting is really important um uh in terms of decentralization, I think from the wallet side, um, also super important to think about. Um, you know, one of the main use cases that we're we're thinking through right now, doing state drops um, and creating other ecosystems on top of um, the platform itself. And the easiest way to do that, we we think is through still through the the Commonwealth UI. Right now, we still have to use um, uh, Polkadot.js, right? So that's like a MetaMask-like solution for the uh, the ecosystem, um, and it's kind of a pain. That, that's a great decent, you know, um, first step in terms of a decentralized solution. But um, having storage, uh, having other things there are, are super important. Um, last thing, I guess, is governance decentralization. So that was a problem a place in which we're most experimental. Um, so everything is upgradable from inflation rate, uh, staking rate, um, you know, setting balances, upgrading the chain itself. Um, all can be done just like from a um, and that's been a really interesting thing. I don't, you know, I, I probably would caution um, other folks to, you know, take that approach. That's kind of like, you know, the one decision that we really did uh, push on. Um, and it's been, it's been interesting itself right now. You can vote to um, disperse money from the treasury. Um, interesting proposals have kind of come through, but there's always the, the side effect of, oh, there's pseudonymous actors here. And it's like, okay. Let, let's wait and see, or like, let's make sure we actually know what people are actually thinking about doing um, with the, uh, the Edgeware token that they um, yeah, might be able to dis disperse. Yeah, thanks everyone for the panel today. I feel like we could talk another hour on this stuff easy. Um, the next panel is a cross chain infra. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us. Appreciate your insights. Um, coming up, we have Jack Platts from the Web3 Foundation, who's going to be uh, working, uh, well, discussing cross-chain infrastructure um, with a couple of different teams that um, are building across different layer ones. So some more interesting perspectives here. Um, I, think, I guess I have to figure out how to, I guess, uh, Dylan, I'm removing you from the stream. It's good to see you. <laughs> Tam, Bye, guys. Nice to see Bye, you. Bye, everyone.